ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. You've heard of it, you might know someone who has it, heck, you might even have it yourself. And while scientists are uncovering new and interesting discoveries about ADHD all the time, there is one thing about it that we've known for certain the whole time. It can make a lot of things in life way harder than they need to be. And one of those things is music production. So as someone who's been a professional music producer for over a decade and has had ADHD since, well, my whole life, I've seen the ups and the downs of being a producer with ADHD. So let's talk about why it sucks and what we can do about it. And even if you don't have ADHD, a lot of these tips will help you be more productive regardless, and you may learn something, so make sure to stick around. And if you're nice, maybe I'll show you some of my favorite ADHD memes, because is it really ADHD if you don't do some kind of side quest? Before we dive into all the music stuff, I do wanna take a little time to talk about what ADHD is and what it isn't because a lot of people who don't have ADHD don't really understand what it is. Well, to put it simply, ADHD is a neurological disorder that leads to lack of impulse control, varied focus, general lack of organization, absent-mindedness, and even mood swings. Okay, I, I'm not really comfortable with this outfit. Like, guys, I'm not a doctor, you know that, right? Oh, dude, don't worry about it, it's fine. So, <clears throat> there are a whole bunch of other quote unquote downstream symptoms of ADHD that aren't officially recognized, like compulsive spending, get it into heated arguments with strangers online, compulsive eating, auditory processing issues, trouble following verbal instructions, auditory processing issues, forgetting what you just said, and the urge to drop everything and move into a converted school bus. These are all things that are fairly common in ADHD folks. So the biggest misconception about ADHD is that it's just a fancy way of saying that you have trouble focusing on boring tasks. Now, a lot of times, if someone tells someone else that they have ADHD, the first thing you're gonna hear back is, yeah, I think I have a little ADHD too, like most of us do, right? And that is definitely not the case. So yeah, avoiding grueling tasks that you don't wanna do, that's not ADHD, it's just being human. Okay guys, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do the doctor thing anymore. This just feels wrong. Come on, wardrobe works so hard on this. This is coming from upstairs. Like, did you get this at Party City? Ward, I mean wardrobe, they didn't even iron the thing, come on. All right, so yeah, I'm not a doctor. I'm not board certified to talk about anything, but what I can do is tell you about my own personal experiences. So the way that my ADHD sort of feels is like I've got this giant grid of screens inside my brain. Now the screen in the middle is what I'm supposed to be focusing on, but all the other stuff kind of gets in the way. So I can use all my brain power and really focus in and block out all the other screens, but that takes so much brain power that eventually it starts to fade and all the other screens start to come back into play. The thing is, this isn't just for tasks that I have to do, for things I don't wanna do. It's for literally everything, whether it's watching a movie or trying to clear my mind while I look at a beautiful sunset, playing a video game, reading a book, Whatever it is, that inner monologue, all these other screens eventually take over. Now what's interesting is that external stimuli will occupy some of those screens. So if there's like a high pitched humming noise in a room, some of those screens are turned focusing on blocking it out. So I'm working in peace and then someone comes in and says, hey, is that noise not bothering you? I'll just be like, what noise? And then the screens fade, I hear the noise, and the distraction starts again. Because of this, noisy environments and things with lots of distractions are actually kind of helpful and help me focus. Whereas like a room with just a desk and a notebook and a pen, that's like the worst place I could imagine trying to get 
anything done because there's nothing there to occupy those other screens. Now that's just my experience. Obviously everyone's brain is a little different, but that's basically what we're dealing with. So we understand what, but how about why? So the science isn't 100% clear on the cause of this condition, but a prevailing theory is that ADHD brains Well, they either don't produce enough or they have trouble processing neurotransmitters like dopamine and norepinephrine, which are chemicals that play a key role in things like motivation, satisfaction, and focus. Some cute little glasses. Yeah. But because of this, it is theorized that people who have ADHD act differently from people who don't because they're trying to find anything that stimulates the reward center of the brain. And basically, they're trying to flood it with those neurotransmitters. Now, the desire to find little hits of dopamine is what leads to the lack of impulse control, since doing something impulsive lights up the reward center of the brain much more than doing something measured and methodical. That's why we have so much trouble forming good habits and routines, or following processes and instructions, or sticking to any long-term goals. And by the way, no, I didn't go to Harvard either. So uh, the wardrobe department and I need to have a meeting. But uh, besides the lack of impulse control, there is another aspect of ADHD called executive dysfunction, which we will cover in another part of the video, because if we don't start talking about music production, the tomatoes are going to start flying. So as you can imagine, having ADHD makes being a music producer pretty tricky. For one, music production is a pretty self-managed career. Nobody is making you clock in at the music production factory, making sure you make five musics a week and then depositing a check into your bank account for you at the end of the week. And beyond that, since ADHD makes long-term planning and goal setting pretty tough, it can be pretty tricky to know if what you're doing is really pushing your career forward. I personally wouldn't describe myself as a consistent person, and most people with ADHD don't really seem to have a five-year plan, let alone a plan for next month. So for a lot of us, it's hard to make sure that we're making positive career moves in the right direction. But more specifically, the actual work of being a music producer can be pretty challenging for people with ADHD. Obviously, being a producer is hard for most people because making great music is a craft that you have to dedicate time to mastering. But the labor itself doesn't always line up with what's easy for ADHD brains. Sitting still for hours in the sweet spot between your studio monitors, comping takes, tuning vocals, gritting drums, programming intense MIDI sequences. These are all things that feel like chores to most people, but we can take care of that, right? Now, you know, one amazing way to be more productive is while you're working, maybe play a podcast that you like listening to or a lo-fi hip hop beats playlist, something like that. That's a really great productivity hack that I love. Hold on, uh, obvious problem right there. How can I work on music while listening to music? Not gonna happen. Anyway, go on. So Joe, another great productivity hack is the Pomodoro technique. It's when you set a 25 minute timer and then when the timer goes off, you take a five to 10 minute break. Go outside, take a walk, get some sunshine. Basically just do something to reset your brain. Okay, wait, I'll, uh, I'll say this much. If there is one thing that clients who are being billed by the hour love, it is frequent breaks to go outside and just walk around because your phone alarm went off. Yeah, probably not gonna work. Any, any other tips? Another way we've discovered to five or even 10X your productivity is to just get a change of scenery. Take your laptop or your iPad outside and do some work out there. Maybe go to a cafe, really just change it up. Oh, and by the way, another great thing that can five to 10X your productivity is our amazing new Gorilla Brain supplements. So you just pop one of these bad boys and 10 to 20 minutes, you'll be rolling, you will be cooking. I mean, seriously, this is gonna 
unlock like 90% more of your brain power. It's amazing. Okay, podcast guy, as soon as I find a Starbucks that's acoustically treated and doesn't mind a little slap bass, I'll be there. And a lot of these focus supplements, they're expensive, questionably researched, and if you read the reviews, most of them are some version of, I'm not sure if it's the supplements or the fact that I started eating exclusively raw liver at the same time, but I do feel like I'm able to get eight to 12% more done each day. Total game changer, five stars. So besides having to juggle multiple projects with different deadlines, there's a whole other side to being a producer that is even harder, the admin work. While there's usually some aspect of working on music that you'll enjoy, things like sending invoices, handling taxes, logging your hours, that is usually the hardest part of it all for me to the point where I've had to make myself sit there and type out an invoice for several thousand dollars from major companies who will obviously pay it. And that's one of the places where executive dysfunction really comes into play. Now, to sum it up quickly, executive dysfunction is your brain basically refusing to do the one task that you actually need to get done. Like, you know you have to do it, you know the steps, it's staring you right in the face and you just won't start. So instead of doing that one task, you'll either go down some other rabbit hole, convince yourself you need to move your studio desk to the other side of the room, or you'll fall into a scroll hole and end up 700 TikToks deep. Or you'll just sit there and think about how screwed you'll be if you don't do that task. So you sit there, you don't write up the invoice, even though it's the last step of the project the easiest one, and the only one you have to do to get paid. And speaking of getting paid, the whole net 30 thing sucks for sure for people with ADHD. So our inability to really plan for long-term stuff, that makes it pretty weird having uh, inconsistent income. Like if I spend an entire week or a month even on a $5,000 project, and then I get paid for it 30 days later, it's money for work I did so long ago. So obviously it's not real money. Now, logically, I know that's not the case, but I have to remind myself that this is money for bills and I need to just put it in my bank account instead of treating it like fun coupons because the next check might not be that big or it might not come for a few more weeks. So we know that we're usually stuck indoors, looking at a screen all day with no background noise, working on a project that may or may not be interesting to us in that moment. Not exactly Dopamine City. But you know what is Dopamine City? Sweetwater.com. So gear acquisition syndrome. If you're a musician or a producer, you probably have it. But for people with ADHD, our compulsive spending makes it so much worse. So you'll be working on a song and yeah, you need a keyboard. And it's cool to use like a MIDI program synth, but you could get like a real vintage synthesizer and that's cooler, right? Or maybe there's a part that's in drop A. So you could tune a regular guitar down, but it'd be way cooler if you had a baritone, right? Well, it's gonna be here Friday, don't worry. Now, I used to get surprised when I'd be working on a song and then suddenly I'm on page 100 of Guitar Center's used section on their website, but now I'm kinda used to it. In fact, I even have a system for dealing with this. So instead of giving in to the temptation of buying something, what I do now is let myself do the research, pick out that piece of gear, then put it in my cart and hit close on the browser. Just putting it in your cart honestly gives you that little dopamine hit that maybe you're looking for, and it'll be there tomorrow or the next day or next week if you decide that you really need that piece of gear. But spoiler alert, nine times out of 10, you actually don't end up going back and hitting buy. Wait, you're not gonna buy anything? So with all that said, I will say that there are some things about ADHD that make us uniquely qualified for producing as well. But before we get to those, it's side quest time, baby. All right, you made it to the side quest. Welcome to the side quest, everybody. If you love side quests, well, you've come to the right place. 
we've got a side quest. We're going to look at some of the ADHD memes, top of all time. Maybe you'll relate, maybe you won't. Let's find out. Just completed a three-minute task I put off for four months. Everyone clap. Me right now, uh, doing this video. The struggle. Forever torn between A, wanting to tell you a story that will show you that I understand your upsetting experience, and B, not saying anything so that you don't think I'm trying to make it about myself. Jesus, this song is good. Plays it 400 times in a row until all the emotion is squeezed from it forever. That's better. Now, who else wants to make me try to feel something? Yeah, done that. Been there. Some psychologist. Most people tend to grow out of ADHD when they're adults. Every single person I know with ADHD. It got worse. Facts. 2020? Facts. How it feels like for ADHD people to listen to someone finish a sentence they already understood within the first few seconds. Oh my gosh. Nothing ruins a person with ADHD's day like a 3 p.m. appointment. That's facts. I had a doctor's appointment at 4.30 today, and holy cow. There's a reason I'm filming this at 8 o'clock. IDK, who needs to hear this, but you don't have to start studying at a round number. You can also start at 5.37. Dude, the bargaining. I'll do it at 8.15. I'll do it at 8.30. Oh, it's already 8.31. Okay, I'll do it at 8.45. Yeah, I don't do round numbers. I do 15-minute intervals. I should work on that. The path to becoming the funny one in your friend group is easy. One, be born with ADHD. Two, devote all of your formative years to figuring out how to make people laugh so they don't abandon you for being annoying. Uh, memes are supposed to be funny, but this one might make me cry. I'm having fun. I'm glad I picked this topic this week. We're having fun, right? Okay, side quest over. I can't. I don't want to look at these anymore. They're making me laugh, but also sad. So, back to the video. All right, side quest time is over. Timer on focusing is reset. Let's talk about the positives of having ADHD as a producer. But before I start, please do not confuse this with the ADHD as my superpower, toxic positivity nonsense that's out there because I absolutely hate that stuff. If I could trade brains with someone who doesn't have ADHD, I would do it in a second. But with that said, one thing that does kind of help guide us towards production is our propensity for random side hobbies. While some violin students dedicate their entire lives to improving at the violin, I went from violin to guitar to drums to keyboards to mandolin to vocals to ukulele. Well, you get the idea. Basically, I can play every instrument from banjo to xylophone at a third grade level, which means I'm not incredible at most of them, but I'm good enough to lay down parts on a song that calls for it. Like, if your music heavily features the mandolin, you probably have a mandolin player who's great. But if you just need any old mandolin part for one song, don't worry, I got you covered. Now, another reason that people with ADHD can often excel in music production is the constant rotation of projects. While we are usually pretty bad at consistently growing one venture, that means that producing for several different artists and bands can be pretty great. As soon as you're over one project, it actually wraps, and then you're onto something new and exciting to hyper-focus on. We're also usually pretty great at shifting gears quickly. So this week, it's a blues band. Next week, it's an orchestral cue for a car commercial and the week after producing rap vocals, no, no problem. Uh, we'll pick things up pretty decently at a pretty good level pretty quickly, and we can usually adapt to new situations well. So it's not uncommon for us to thrive in scenarios where other people may need some time to adjust. If you can think of any other reasons that having ADHD and producing music actually doesn't suck, let me know in the comments. But now let's move on to what we can do about the parts that do suck. So one thing that I am not going to cover is medication, CBT, really anything that would be best discussed with your doctor. And I'm also not going to recommend any self-medication because I want this video to stay monetized and because those types of things can lead to some somewhat poor outcomes. What I will talk about, however, 
is everything that I have done to be more productive and help keep my music career mostly on the right track. So first up, let's talk about filling up those brain screens. While we can't put on a podcast while we're working on music, there is something similar that I've found. So while I do most of my music work on my speakers, I do a lot of the boring parts like tuning and editing with headphones on, and I have them kind of loud. Nothing too wild, of course, but the closeness and the higher volume makes it a little easier to focus through it. It might be more stimulating because the close-up sound of the headphones, or it might be that thing that makes dogs go into work mode when you give them a backpack, or it might just be a big old placebo, I don't know, but it works for me, so give that a try next time you just can't make yourself do something tedious. So that helps with the task avoidance executive function part of the brain. What about the dopamine hunting side? For that, I like to give myself lots of little stimuli that don't take away from being productive. So if you just sit down and start working empty handed, you might start thinking about that next dopamine hit. But if you come with your iced Americano, your sparkling water, some kind of snack you can eat like a hundred of without feeling gross, maybe light a candle, turn on a lava lamp, basically just get ahead of the random cravings and eventual boredom, you'll probably get a lot more done. Fun gadgets and weird little satisfying quirky things that you like also help. If you think it's cool to have a metal can koozie for your LaCroix, get one. It's great for avoiding those, I got too locked in and now my drink is room temperature moments that send you back to the fridge for a fresh one. If you find it's fun to have the sonic crushed ice in your drinks, get a crushed ice maker. Basically make these little parts of your day engaging and dopaminergic and you'll stay focused for longer. I thought fidget toys were all either bright silicone or loud fidget spinners until I found this one that looks like the totem from Inception, which is kind of neat. So if you want something a little more upscale, you could grab something like that. I'll put a link in the pinned comments to my favorite little doohickeys if you want to check those out. Another way to get rid of task avoidance is to make deadlines and tell people about them. If I owe someone a mix and I have time to do it on Thursday, I'll literally tell them, hey, I'm going to do your mix on Thursday. So keep an eye out for it either Thursday PM or first thing Friday. That will put me in a little bit of a do or die situation, which is usually when we do our best work anyways. So that typically helps me keep things on a tight schedule. Now what you don't want to do is lie and tell someone that you'll have 10 of their mixes done for them in one day because you're either going to fail miserably or burn yourself out by succeeding. So just give real timetables and then stick to them and set a reminder, ask Siri to remind you right away so you don't forget. Another type of deadline you can give yourself is a recurring deadline for personal projects. So when I started my solo synthwave project, I made sure to make it a point that I was dropping a new song every month for a year, and I was able to pull that off. For this YouTube channel right here, I say out loud in like almost all of my videos that you should subscribe because I post a new music production video every single Friday at 6 p.m. EST. And here we are filming um, late at night, but hey, it's getting done either way. It's practically a miracle that I've managed to post a video every week for over a year, but that public deadline helps keep me accountable. One thing that also works really well is body doubling. Now, if you're not familiar, that's when you work with someone else there. It's not that you work together on the same thing. You can both throw on headphones and ignore each other the whole time. But the fact that they are there at all just means you're more likely to actually do the work since you don't want to get caught procrastinating. Sometimes I'll have this weird thought in my head where I feel like I'm tricking the other person into thinking I'm doing the work and being productive. It's like the voice in my head goes, wow, I'm so sneaky that I convinced this sucker that I'm productive by doing all this work in front of them. So sneaky. Uh, can't explain that, but that's, that's how it is. So the nice thing about working with artists in person is that you're basically body doubling every time you have a session. That person to person interaction makes it easy to stay engaged. So the temptation to pick up your phone or go antiquing or buy a cotton candy machine 
or whatever it is you normally do when you don't want to work, well, it basically vanishes. But now that more projects are remote, I found it helpful to just have a friend over and offer to hang while I work on tunes. Usually I get a ton done while they're there, but if no one is around to body double with you, a good alternative is going live. You get the triple benefit of promoting the work you're doing, tying up your phone, and giving yourself an audience that you have to perform for by actually working on the music. Just make sure it's cool with the artist if you go live, if it's not your own stuff. Another trick I have is to minimize your distractions when you need to focus on decision making. And what I mean by that is to not allow yourself the chance to interrupt yourself when you're doing certain tasks. Like if you need to do some critical listening to make sure that your production is a final production, turn your screen off after you hit play so you're not tempted to start grabbing the mouse and moving things around. If you're not sure about a mix, export it as a wave and listen back to it in iTunes and take notes in a piece of paper or your phone so you don't keep pausing it to make little tweaks in your DAW. Now, much has been said about screen time being a big problem for people with ADHD, but we need our computers to do the work. However, it is smart to turn off all your email and text notifications and take distracting apps like Safari out of your main app menu. Basically make it so you don't see a notification number or an icon that makes you wanna do something besides work. That text or email can wait until the end of the session. Trust me. Do you think the Beatles would have written so many number ones if their tape machines could all go on Twitter? I'm gonna say no. And while turning off notifications is a great first step to digital decluttering, I've got a whole video on that topic right here. So watch this video next.